on to the inaugural Women in Intensive Care ANZIX webinar. I'm Vanessa Carnegie, I'm the WA rep for WIN. I'll be helping to moderate the session today. We're very lucky to have two incredible intensivists who will be speaking to us today, Dr. Mary Pinder and Dr. Neil Orford. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Mary Pinder. Mary is an intensivist at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital in Perth. She's the previous chair of the college examinations and is now the president of CICM. Thank you so much to Mary for speaking to us today. Okay. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to um, Vanessa, Sandra, um, Ravi and Suzanne um, for inviting me to, um, to talk to you all today. Um, and I'd also like to say thank you to um, Brett, um, Brent in the background there um, for doing all the technical support for us. Um, hopefully I won't need too much um, during this talk. Um, I'd just like to start as well by saying that as a binational community, we acknowledge traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and recognize their unique cultural and spiritual relationships to the land, waters and seas and their rich contribution to society. We pay our respect to elders past, present and emerging and we strive to improve the health of our First Nations peoples. We also acknowledge and respect Māori as the Tangata Whenua of Aotearoa and are committed to upholding the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi, supporting Māori fellows and trainees and striving for equitable outcomes for the health of Māori. So what I'm going to talk to you today um, is aspects of leadership. Um, and I was um, saying earlier, um, just before the webinar started, um, that when I was asked to speak, it actually gave me a chance to kind of reflect on how I got where I am. Um, and I found that was actually quite um, a useful experience. Um, and I'm hoping this talk will resonate with you um, and provide some sort of take home messages, whether you're a trainee just starting out on your ICU journey um, or a new fellow who's looking to develop your leadership skills or um, an established consultant um, who has responsibilities for um, supervising and mentoring uh, junior colleagues. So my talk is essentially um, going to be in three parts. Um, the first is looking at our preconceptions of what a trainee and a consultant should look like, and um, then sharing my personal perspective on my own um, leadership journey. Uh, and I'll try not to be too self-indulgent. Um, and then I'd like to look a bit at um, where as a community um, we need to go. Um, and that will also lead into um, Neil's talk um, on culture. So first up, um, let's have a look at addressing preconceptions. So um, when I started my ICU career, um, the sort of atmosphere was, for want of a better word, pretty blokey, um, with a very sort of male orientated flavor to ICU. And consultants were predominantly white males um, and working um, in the tertiary institutions in the capital cities. And this was really the sort of driver of the overriding culture of ICU at that time. Um, and I think we see that with cognitive biases, um, there's a tendency to reward those we see as mirroring our own traits um, that we consciously or unconsciously recognize in ourselves. Um, and this is the sort of um, underlying aspects of how we come to first impressions. Um, and the good side, the, um, the red spidey, 
is our adaptive unconscious. Um, and that's important for us for making um, decisions about critically ill patients, you know, recognizing someone who's unstable, um, instantly recognizing whether um, a junior colleague is able to do a procedure, for example. Um, and just in our general lives, um, giving us information about um, our safe environment um, and making instant decisions to bring about um, effective actions. The dark side of this is um, the unconscious bias and related to our um, implicit underlying um, biases and uh, stereotypical views. Um, and some of the cognitive biases that can affect us um, is that similar to me bias, where again, we're looking um, for people who um, mimic our traits or people that we recognize as coming from our tribe um, and uh, having similar views and attitudes to us. Um, another problem can be um, related to um, halo and devil effect where um, it can be often a very um, minor incident, um, but that can color our impressions of that individual or, or that person. And we extrapolate from that action um, how they are in general. Um, so someone who, um, you know, for example, does a good presentation on a ward round may then instantly be assumed to be a very competent um, uh, doctor. Um, or conversely, someone who's made um, uh, an error or a mistake in doing a procedure um, then has great doubts cast on their, their overall competency and their ability to practice. Um, and I think it's very easy for us to make um, those assumptions and translate what we see as um, assertiveness and confidence um, into competence, um, and that that can be a, that can be a real problem. Um, what I also see sometimes is that there can be groupthink, um, and if one person comes up with a comment um, about a trainee, um, and one I heard recently was, "Oh, you know, this trainee is a little bit timid," um, and then everyone kind of jumps in with um, their impressions to um, give credibility and growth to and legs to that, um, that impression, um, which may not be accurate. So I think we have to be mindful that although um, our thin slicing and first impressions can be, can be useful and stem from a depth of experience um, and uh, how we work in the world, but we also need to be very aware of our implicit biases um, and the risk of um, having a stereotypical view of those around us. So I'm, I'm guessing that, you, that some of you, um, at least at some point um, in your career, have had feedback where you were told that you need to be more assertive. And you were probably left wondering what that meant um, and you know, how you were going to do that and how you were going to actually you know, change your underlying personality. And I think sometimes supervisors have a fixed idea of a good trainee as someone who speaks loudly, asks a lot of questions and is a bit bossy. So how does that work if you're a quiet, reflective person who understands instructions the first time and learns best by finding out the answers yourself? How do you make yourself appear more assertive if that's not actually you? And how does that translate into being a consultant? Can you only be a good leader if your voice naturally carries from one end of the unit to the other? Well, the answer is obviously no. Um, and I'm now going to talk about what's worked for me. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of people out there who were surprised to learn that I was going to take over from Ray as president of the college. And to be honest, I was one of them. Um, when I started out in intensive care, I knew that leadership was part of being an intensivist, but I didn't look beyond that. 
Um, and certainly I didn't um, think that I could be president or have aspirations to be president. And so when I was first asked, my, uh, my initial reaction was, um, was disbelief um, and um, some concern for the, the mental well-being of my colleagues and their decision-making capacity. Um, and I didn't really see myself in that role. I'd had the same reaction though, when I was asked to be chair of the exam committee. Um, one of the nicest compliments I've had um, when I was in this role was from one of the other examiners who told me that I epitomized the humble servant leader. At the time, I didn't even know that was like a leadership style um, and I had to go and look it up. Um, but now I can see that this leadership style represents the values we want for our community and underpins the culture we want for our specialty. So what is humble servant leadership? Um, I'm going to quote Daniel M. Cable, um, who's written an article for the Harvard Business Review. So servant leaders have the humility, courage, and insight to admit that they can benefit from the expertise of others who have less power than them. They actively seek the ideas and unique contributions of the employees that they serve. This is how servant leaders create a culture of learning and an atmosphere that encourages followers to become the very best they can. Humility and servant leadership do not imply that leaders have low self-esteem or take on an attitude of civility. Instead, servant leadership emphasizes that the responsibility of a leader is to increase the ownership, autonomy and responsibility of followers to encourage them to think for themselves and to try out their own ideas. And I think particularly that, um, that line that says servant leaders create a culture of learning and an atmosphere that encourages followers to become the very best they can um, is what resonates with me particularly. I'm sure also this will resonate with a lot of you as a style of leadership um, that um, you, you already aspire to and already have traits um, in keeping with that. And I'd certainly, you know, in the questions and discussion at the end, I'd like to hear what you found works for you. Um, I'm going to cover a few points that I found helpful, um, although I have to say that I still feel I don't always get things right. And for me, like all things, you know, leadership is still a work in progress. So some of the traits that we have um, include compassion, concern for others, kindness and honesty. And these are all qualities that we should be showing for our patients and, our next of, and their next of kin. Um, and that's no different when we come to interacting with our colleagues. I find that you know, if you're genuinely interested in someone um, and want to know their story and where they're coming from, it does a lot to foster team spirit um, and certainly makes the workday a, a lot more fun and pleasurable. I think also I found that um, people often say that um, I, I seem to get on with most people um, and I think we all find that, you know, we work with such a mix of people and they're always someone that rubs you up the wrong way or, you know, someone that you find irritating or, you know, there's just something about their attitude. Um, and I think it's always good to be able to kind of look beyond those kind of spiky bits that can, you know, can be irritating, um, but find the inner core and the, the depth in someone um, and the parts that you can relate to, the parts that you do like. Um, and really, you know, the, the psychopaths who walk among us are very few. Um, and I think we can all find um, those aspects of someone that we can relate to and, and genuinely like. Um, and in that, I think is um, where everything stems from. Um, and just having that connection with, with our fellows. Other things that are important um, is the importance of listening. 
Um, and a lot of these qualities, um, I know, I'm sure some of you are um, uh, do simulation training and are very good debriefers. Um, and these skills translate into how we can act as leaders in our daily lives as well. So, you know, don't make assumptions as to what people might be thinking or why they've done things a certain way. You need to actually ask. And then you need to listen to what they're saying. And that doesn't mean just the words. It also means all the, the nonverbal communication as well. Um, I was struck by an interview I heard on the radio um, with one of the leaders of the Irish campaign for marriage equality, yes, equality. Um, and he made the point that no one's ever won an argument just by calling the other person a narrow-minded bigot. And you actually have to uh, establish trust, listen to the other person, hear their views, understand where their beliefs are coming from, and then work on showing them an alternative viewpoint um, and getting them to um, see the value of, of your beliefs and change their behavior and their attitudes. Another thing I found um, that's worked is to be open about your shortcomings. And um, Margaret Bierman and Liz Malloy, um, the well-known educators from Melbourne, um, have coined the term intellectual streaking, um, which they applied to um, uh, a metaphor for teachers exposing their shortcomings to their students. But I think this also works for us as leaders. Um, and it helps build trust. Um, and I think also um, we are deluded if we think those about us don't recognize our shortcomings um, ahead of us. So I think that um, although there always is a little bit uncertainty and anxiety um, about um, admitting your failings um, and showing your vulnerability, um, I think it's something that um, those around you will respect you for um, and, and find that sort of reassuring. Um, I found again, when I was chair of the exam committee, you know, one of my worries was that I, oh God, you know, I'll, I need to know everything. Um, but I very quickly realized that I was surrounded by very smart people. Um, and if I said there was something I didn't know, um, it was either a reassurance for people because they didn't know it either, or it made people feel good about themselves because they did. Um, and so it was really a sort of win-win situation. And no one, absolutely no one ever came back to me and said, really, you didn't know that, you should. Um, so I, I think although we are often scared to show our vulnerability, um, it really does um, uh, establish trust um, and openness and honesty. Along with this as well, I think it's important to own up to your mistakes, um, to admit when you're wrong and to be the first to, apolog to apologize. Um, and one of the best conference presentations I've heard um, was from Bronwyn Beebe at the 2018, I think it was, um, ANSIC Safety and Quality Conference. Um, and she spoke about this very topic, about the importance of admitting um, that the other person was right um, and that you were wrong. Um, and uh, if you ever get a chance to hear Bronwyn talk about that, I would recommend that you take it. Um, but I think that, again, is something that we often don't do. Um, and pride, um, uh, you know, a sense of... Uh, the wrong sense of self often gets in the way of our ability to apologize. But again, that is such an important aspect um, in building trust and being open and honest. And lastly, I think it's always important to acknowledge others, um, acknowledge their work and, and give them credit. Every one of us needs to feel valued and appreciated for who we are and what we do. Um, and a little bit of recognition um, goes a long way. Okay, so 
what can we do to break the mold? What can you do in a leadership role? Um, and where do we go from here? So I think it's important um, to be the leader that you are. You don't have to be the leader that someone else is. You don't have to um, fall into a pattern of stereotypes. Um, you don't have to change your personality. And with this, I think it's important to challenge those stereotypes um, and address bias and faulty thinking. Um, in our workplace, we should encourage a flat hierarchy. So even the most junior person uh, can contribute to the conversation um, and can point out errors, um, question decision-making, um, ask questions. Um, to do this, we need to promote a good workplace culture. And Neil is going to speak more about this um, for you. Um, we need to work for equity and diversity. Um, and we need to start the journey to cultural safety. As a community, we're very much at the beginning of this um, journey to cultural safety. Um, and in terms of my own journey, I don't think I've barely got to the front gate. Um, and I'm certainly not you know, qualified to, to speak in depth about this, um, but I do, enough, do know enough to realize that cultural safety is lifelong learning. Um, it's not just doing an online module or a half day bookshop or writing a reflective piece. Um, that's a start, but it's the change in mindset and attitudes and growth in understanding um, that comes over time. Rudine Sims Bishop, um, she's now in her 80s, um, but she's an educator who's um, from the US who's been credited as being the mother of multicultural children's literature. And in the 1990s, she published an article entitled Mirrors, Windows and Sliding Glass Doors um, that described a metaphor for how children from diverse backgrounds can see themselves in literature um, and become part of the story and gain self-affirmation. And we can expand that metaphor um, for our community. So I think for, for trainees from um, all backgrounds, um, particularly those who are indigenous or from um, uh, minority backgrounds or, or groups who um, suffer prejudice and bias, um, if they're able to look at us um, and see through a window to see um, trainees and fellows um, in our community, if they can then see themselves reflected as becoming those trainees and fellows, and then they are able to walk through a, a sliding glass door that is held open for them um, to allow them to enter and become a part of that community. Lastly, I would just like to say that, um, and I apologize maybe from going to the sublime of um, Rudine the Sims Bishop to um, Ian Fleming, um, but if the archetypal um, blokey white male uh, can change their image and become this, then I think there's help, hope for us and our community too. And I would just leave you with a, a quote from um, Jane Goodall. Thanks so much, Mary. Um, it was so refreshing to hear your story and your success as well being true to yourself. Um, just for the audience, I encourage all of you to use the Q&A function to start asking some questions, which we have some time to do now. Um, I do have one question that's come through. Um, one, um, somebody has asked um, Mary what your thoughts were. Um, there are many psychometric tests which can help frame individual communication and leadership styles. Um, for example, the people styles. Um, do you think it would be helpful for our trainees um, to have the opportunity to um, sometimes take these sort of assessments to help cultivate their individual leadership styles? Um, sorry, I was a little bit distracted trying to stop the screen share. Um, could you just re repeat the question? 
Yeah, um, the question was, um, there's lots of different sort of psychometric tests out, um, out there that can help people sort of um, um, have a um, reflection about their individual leadership style, styles and um, communication and people styles. Um, do you think that these sorts of um, assessments might help trainees, for example, um, cultivate their own um, leadership styles? Um, I'm not a qualified psychologist, so I have to say I'm always a little bit um, suspicious of those kind of um, kind of tests. Um, I know um, I know Bruce Lister always um, criticizes the Maya Briggs personality one, for example, by saying it was actually devised by um, either Maya or Briggs, not sure which one, but whose daughter, she was concerned about the men her daughter was dating. So she devised this personality um, rating scale so she could kind of check out um, you know, potential boyfriends or future son-in-laws, which, um, yeah, which sounds a dodgy place to start to begin with. Um, I think that there are certainly some that I, I think if they encourage um, self-reflection, I think that's probably the most valuable point um, there's a, a, um, a test I know that I think um, uh, you can do on, on the website that actually looks at your um, underlying biases. I can't remember what it's called for the moment, um, but um, that sort of shows you how you make associations between different words or different um, personality traits and can be quite revealing in yourself in, in where your biases are. Um, I think that I guess the, the short answer is that there are many different leadership styles. And I think it's important to unlock what works for you and who you are um, and how you interact with others rather than trying to fit yourself to a, a particular type. Sure. I think it's the Harvard Implicit Association test. Is, that's, that's it. Thanks, thanks, Lucy. Yes. Um, there is another question that, that's come through, Mary. Um, this one is, how do you manage um, when women leaders in the workplace are, dis, um, are being dismissed? Um, um, and the voice, um, and there's a, I think the question is sort of asking, in the, is the predominance of the voice of male leaders instead in the workplace? Um, and these sort of the predominance of this sort of male voice then um, doesn't um, give women's opinions and, um, and acknowledge the um, women's opinions with the same credence or weighting. Um, I think um, they were just trying to ask how you would, um, might approach that kind of situation. Um, I guess if that's kind of a situation, from, from a personal perspective, I have to say, I, I, I feel I've always been very fortunate and I've been taken, um, for myself, not for what I might represent, you know, not for being white or English or female or living in Perth, um, um, but for myself. And um, I don't know if you ask me, I don't know whether that's because I've been fortunate in the people I've had around me and the mentors I've had, or whether it's um, something about myself that, that, that projects that. Um, I I've, know I've been very fortunate in to be a person who's not experienced um, bias or prejudice. Um, and I have no concept of what it must be like for, for someone who is from a different ethnic background, who um, that is the first thing that everybody sees um, you know, when they walk in a shop, when they get in a taxi, when they apply for a job. Um, and um, you know how, how they do that, I don't know. Um, I guess it goes back to um, what I said about the, um, the, the uh, guy involved in the campaign for um, marriage equality in Ireland, and that you know telling someone that you know they're um, racist or a bigot or narrow-minded or some you know however you put it. Um, it won't change their attitudes um, and won't, won't put them in a frame of mind to listen to your argument. So I think you have to um, be able to establish common ground, um, establish respect, um, see where they're coming from, hear where they're coming from, 
um, and then uh, work towards changing their attitudes and, 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 and changing their minds. So for them, it comes from the heart. It's not just a tick box because this is what I have to do at work. Otherwise, um, you know, I'll get, um, I'll get penalized or, you know, I'll, um, yeah, there'll be a problem with HR. Um, you know, this is what I truly believe. And I think role modeling um, with those around us, um, role modeling with our, our colleagues, uh, with senior and junior, with all our um, uh, friends, um, with everyone we come into contact um, and being true to ourselves, I think is, is the important thing. Thanks, Mary. Um, I think Lucy also um, had her hand up to, um, to talk. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, I would also like to offer an answer to that question, if that's okay. I think um, this is because this is something I've really thought about a lot as to, um, you know, at times the imbalance in voices that we hear, particularly in our workplaces, and, you know, who, whose voices are we hearing from a lot and which voices are we, and particularly, I guess, from different minority groups, where may we be hearing less from? Um, and that may be simply because there are fewer people from that minority group in your workplace. Um, or it may be because there are reasons that they don't feel they're able to speak up. Um, and so I think my approach to this is firstly to actually be aware of who is talking and who's being listened to. I think that's the first thing. And, and in particular, be aware of um, which perspectives you're not hearing, because of course that's always very valuable in a team and for any leader to be aware of, you know, potential blind spots or perspectives that aren't being represented. Um, and then once you're aware of that, I think it becomes easier um, to try to overtly amplify the voices that, um, that aren't heard. Uh, and the, the two ways that I think you can do this is firstly, um, if you think it's safe and appropriate, then just ask, like seek out that person's opinion or perspective if, if something's being discussed and that might be on a ward round or it might be in a meeting. Um, and the second thing is if, if um, a perspective is shared by someone that, um, you know, uh, regardless of who that person is, perhaps is a perspective that's not the, um, uh, a commonly heard one, then there are a lot of ways to amplify that just either by asking that person to expand on it and clarify that point or to simply be the second person to say, yes, I've, I've noticed that too. Because um, I think that, you know, when, um, when meetings can or ward rounds can descend into group think, it's often um, can be really helpful to hear that alternative perspective and for it to actually <clears throat> have the air to breathe and not to immediately be either dismissed or moved on from. So I think um, my three things would be be aware of which perspectives are potentially being missed, seek out the perspectives that are, um, are being missed. And, and if you hear um, someone speak up, um, then seek to amplify their voice by asking them further questions or um, or you know, perhaps throwing your weight behind it. Thank you. Thanks, Lucy. Um, I think we should move on to Neil. But thanks so much, Mary, for your talk. I really, I really enjoyed that, and I think so did everyone else. Um, if there are more questions at the end for Neil and for Mary, we can address that after Neil's talk as well. Um, I would like to um, move on to Neil, though. So we're really, really lucky to have Neil come to speak to us today. Um, um, Dr. Orford is an intensivist and the director of the intensive care unit at Geelong Hospital. Um, he's actively involved in clinical research and is also the clinical lead for the iValidate Day program. Um, we're really delighted to have him here today. So um, you can start, Neil. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'll just share the screen. Um, I'll have to update that I am no longer the director of ICU. Claire Cadigan is the director of ICU. I'm very grateful to Claire. Um, uh, just check, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so firstly, uh, it is a privilege to be part of this webinar. Thank you. Um, I'll just make sure I can advance. I appear to have just had a little glitch with this. Let me unshare for a second and fix it. Let 
it will work in two seconds. Um, okay, I think I'm sharing again. Even though for some reason I can't, there we go. Okay, now it's moving forward. Um, so over the next 15 minutes, I will talk about culture in ICU, uh, my experience of good and not so good, um, what I've learned from this, um, maybe what we could aim for in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, like Mary, this talk has made me reflect more carefully on an area I'm heavily invested in uh, and I'm still learning. So I thought this is a Good opportunity to include this painting from local artist Taryn Love, a proud young uh, Gunjit Marakire Wurong woman from Western Victoria, um, who has given me permission to use this painting. So this is Napoon Nirang Kalachia, which means grandmother, mother, daughter. Um, her mother wrote the description um, to the painting, uh, and it's about women, the importance of connectedness, the strength and power of relationships. And perhaps that's the central tenet of this talk is um, about relationships and how we treat each other. Um, I might add uh, in light of Mary's talk that I now report to a president, Mary, for, on the board and to a director, Claire, who epitomise these qualities of leaders who are skilled, reflective and care deeply about those that they are responsible for. It's quite humbling. So in 2016, the, the board of the College of Intensive Care published a survey reporting prevalence of bullying at 32%, discrimination 12%, sexual harassment at 3% in Australia and New Zealand. Um, intensive care is not alone in this, unprofessional behaviour and medical specialties, including bullying, harassment, discrimination, incivility and rudeness have been widely reported across Australia, New Zealand and internationally. And while they might be the extreme and perhaps the most visible forms of negative professional behaviour, they probably represent only one part of the broader spectrum of behaviours and skills that define our cultures, or these shared way of thinking and feeling and behaving. The risk of poor culture is clear, um, a lack of diversity, lack of representation in our workforce, burnout, absenteeism, mental health issues, impaired teamwork, loss of unit accreditation, and of course, and crucially, worse patient outcomes. The benefits of great culture are clear, the opposite. So can we systematically improve, measure, and share good culture and great culture across our ICUs? Um, I'll just give you a very brief uh, idea about me because uh, if I'm going to talk about culture I guess I have to give you some sense of why you should listen to anything I have to say. Um, so as a clinician I work in Geelong and we serve southwest Victoria. Um, I work predominantly at um, University Hospital Geelong um, but also uh, at St John of God Healthcare. Um, I have non-clinical interests that are academic, um, a deacon and the ANZIC RC at Monash um, I validate, which is our communication for end of life care and shared decision making program. Uh, I participate with Open Heart International as a volunteer intensivist. Uh, and in the last couple of years, I've been a board member for the college, which is a steep learning curve, but I'm the deputy chair of the hospital accreditation committee and heavily involved in their culture framework. I also have a personal life. Um, with uh, grown children's friends, family around me, pets. Um, and I, I try to fit all these things together, like all of us. So I might just start with, a, uh, in terms of culture, I've got some local lessons uh, that I experienced in my 12 years as director and perhaps share a story. Um, so in 2011, um, there was a, a tragic uh, death of a toddler in our hospital uh, that was unexpected and a huge tragedy for the family and the repercussions reverberated through our hospital and was very damaging. Um, the response was extraordinary. Um, there was an early response that really was based on psychological safety 
So we listened to each other. Um, we tried to understand people's perspectives, what happened. We avoided blame and we built trust. The next stage is that we developed a solution. We recognised we had a major children's hospital inside an adult hospital, that our critical care model was based on calling on an external provider, and that left this vulnerable period that exposed patients. What we saw in that stage was this commitment um, to the patients, the children, the families in our region by a broad group, Royal Children's Hospital, Barwon Health, um, you know, paediatricians, intensivists, ED, allied health, nursing staff. So there was a commitment. Um, time was put towards it. Um, we spent a lot of time talking, working out, listening. We learned and problem solved together and came up with a solution. The next bit was our senior executive um, engaged with us or we engaged with them and they supported us and listened and took some risks uh, and helped us come up with this model of a paediatric ICU and our adult ICU that worked. And then we went on a process of implementing and training and measuring in this continued safety environment of learning, you know, com uh, meetings, communication, celebrating successes, pretty carefully avoiding losses uh, in the early stages and just um, trying to make this work. And so in response, we went from admitting less than 10 children a year for the 10 years prior to that with one tragic death to we've admitted over 1,200 children to our ICU in the last 10 years with no deaths. And I know deaths are rare in children, but they matter. So our institution went from a tragic sort of defining event um, and an uncertain model of care to a successful uh, model of care with a mature service and a lot of collaboration. And that was only possible due to culture. And I have to say the extraordinary efforts that, um, of our new director, Claire Cadigan, who led that program. So I worked for seven CEOs in my time as director of RCU and my organization um, experienced periods of strong, positive people-centered culture, which is what we saw for this example. And unfortunately periods where that wasn't the case. And I've reflected many times uh, about what would have happened if this crisis had occurred in our worst two years, the years where we had no psychological safety due to divisive, unpredictable sort of blame cultures, um, poor engagement between senior medical staff and executive, no time to, to, to do things and no structure to problem solve. And the answer is depressingly clear that is that rather than listen, support and solve, we would have blamed, lost good people and divided and ended up with something worse for our patients and staff. And that is not good enough. Our ability to deliver the highest standard of healthcare effectively, innovatively, compassionately to critically ill people should not cycle from good to bad with uncontrolled changes in institutional culture or unit subculture. In an ideal world, we, ICU clinicians, will become effective enough to control this. And it's a big ask, but I think it might be possible. So don't worry about reading the slide, it's just an example. Um, uh, so I'm fortunate that uh, in our ICU and institution over the last sort of five, eight years, but particularly the last three years, we've started this culture journey um, we started with a consultant group uh, with a, working with a corporate coach and that's increased in recent years to us partnering with this external culture organisation called the NAUS Group. And, and over the last three years, we've gone through this process of listening to staff through forums, surveys, understanding the culture, what is good, what is not so good, um, followed by a fairly intense all of ICU leadership and uh, teamship capability program where we undertook collectively I think over 500 hours of staff contact and training. We are now going through a leadership program um, involving improving our collective knowledge and capability, creating a shared vision, and then hopefully we will continue this with a all of ICU program. Um, again, you don't have to read this, but it's been an it. There have been interesting lessons for us. Um, we've learned about culture, how to change it. We've developed the shared language. We've learned a lot from external experts. We have a long way to go, um, but 
we appear to be on a path. So from, from looking at all that, from this, from my experience, looking at what we've gone through with now, uh, looking at the evidence um, as, a, as a hospital accreditation member, looking at other units, uh, interactions with industry, um, I can see a possible framework that is developing uh, for ICUs. Um, so there are domains of culture and um, Leslie Curry from the Leadership Saves Lives Pro uh, Global Initiative in Yale, they've done a lot of work of the of health place culture and they talk about these five domains and there are other models, but this sort of resonates in some ways for me at the moment. Um, I think we recognise that there are competencies and these are some of, uh, can, you can come up with dozens about um, things we need to be good at if we're going to um, be better at, um, as leaders, as uh, team players um, and in terms of culture. I think one of the very important things for us in our program was context. Um, I see you doctors, nurses, allied health, appear to be event and task focused. Um, I think we're really good at that. And when they developed this moments that matter um, idea, um, it gave this sort of context specific focus on where to apply domains and competencies to. And these are things we all recognize, family meetings, ward rounds, you know, multidisciplinary meetings, um, incidental conversations where we see culture in real life. And so the idea of applying um, within each of those moments, uh, cultural competencies seems possible. And the last thing is, is the adaptive nature of this. Um, it's easy to put culture to the background. Um, we've, we've done this in the face of a number of crises. One, of course, is COVID, but we had a cyber attack in our unit at the end of 20, in our hospital at the end of 2019 that saw us have no electronic systems for months. Um, we went through COVID, like all of us, uh, we had a staff member die in our unit. Um, and amongst all those things, our knee-jerk reaction was to stop our culture program. But then we adapted it to those scenarios we're going through, and it's ended up being helpful and given us more capability to, to deal with what we're going through. So I think around Australia and New Zealand, there are ICUs doing wonderful, innovative things to improve and maintain culture. And you would all have experience of this. There are also ICUs in trouble. Um, and that varies over time within units. Um, and we all probably know who some of, who, you know, had an idea of where these units are. And we talk about who's in trouble and who's doing well. I think we know that at the community level but we don't really measure it and we haven't really established a framework for it. So the college as part of its strategic plan, having listened to our fellows and trainees and each other, um, it would appear this is very important to everyone. And this idea of making a framework for leadership and teamwork and culture has gained traction. And I think what we're talking about is defining what we mean by that and are we, you know, what's great, what's good, what's troubled look like and why. Um, measuring and assessing culture, um, building capability and understanding how to do that and how to improve and maintain it and probably making all this visible. Um, we are starting on a process of this and um, I, I I think that we're heading down a road that looks like establishing a very diverse advisory group, probably with a lot of smaller groups to cover all these domains and competencies, um, collaborating with um, each other, with other specialty groups who've had experience in this, academic institutions um, who are interested, and they are. Um, I've spoken to um, experts at Yale and Harvard and they're, they are very excited about the idea of working with us on this because it's a binational healthcare changing program. There are industry experts uh, um, who can teach us a lot. And of course, consumers, we need to define the scope. You know, what are we, are we talking about culture and teamwork and leadership and wellbeing and, and are there other things we mean? Um, like most change programs, we have to go through establishing vision, goals, and strategies, and working groups and uh, objectives and getting there. I think there'll need to be a really heavy design program 
stage um, uh, because this is important and complicated and big a discovery process has to go on for a period of time before we get into um, building it. Uh, eventually we could pilot this somewhere and then perhaps at the end we would have a large scale sort of before and after culture trial around the two countries. These are just my grand ideas. Um, uh, so in my head, and this, will, this slide will probably never see the light of day again, is that we're looking at this kind of matrix of there are these um, competencies that we will develop and they'll change. Um, uh, and there will be more that will establish these domains of culture, which may change. We'll have to work out how we're going to measure them, which is a huge task. Uh, and then what is available um, for both individuals and teams to improve. And they will range from low touch online modules to high touch, um, you know, things like we're doing with NAUS where we have a team kind of work in our unit. Um, and I suspect that the idea of doing this around um, context specific um, areas may resonate, but again, there'll be much uh, better people than me at this uh, working on that. And so that's where we are now and hopefully where we will, how we will continue. Um, and I, what really matters is getting feedback from people. So every opportunity I get to talk about this, what I'm most interested in is what you all have to say about it and hearing from people. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. That talk was great. Um, it's really interesting. Um, I, we actually do have a few questions that um, have come through. There is one that is for both you and, um, and Mary. Um, to heavily paraphrase the US Supreme Court, um, it's hard to define good culture, but you will know when you see it. Um, the Barwon Health Experience clearly shows an organization that prioritizes this. How do we achieve this in organizations where culture um, is an issue and so cultural change is clearly not a priority? Um, given that culture is a complex multi-system and seemingly immutable issue, how do you bring about meaningful change in systems that are reluctant or resistant to change? Um, this question is probably a good one to ask now, just given that it's highly relevant to your talk, Neil, as well as Mary's. Uh, Mary, do you want me to have a go at that first? Um, since you're muted, <laughs> I'll take this a yes. So <laughs> I agree with all that. And I think that's now up to us. Um, I, uh, so the, the sort of hack in our local experience is that I suspect we do know what, I think we can define the components of good culture reasonably you know in like those domains once you start looking at it it becomes clear um which bits are missing uh, so i i think we could build a picture of from looking at our really currently successful units um and the ones who are struggling of what what the difference is um I th there's a challenge in how to measure that and assess it and make it and fairly transparent um I think we'll, I reckon we'll get there. I think that's doable. I think the, the real challenge for us will be accepting that we have a role is how do we not allow changes in, in the government and executive attitudes towards health in hospitals? How do we protect those cultures and how do we become strong enough advocates to um, not allow external forces to change that? Um, and I suspect that's falls somewhere into something about united voice and us taking up a role in advocacy more vocally. But I'm not sure, Mary, if you have other thoughts on that or anyone else has. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, we, we can't change, um, you know, the, the attitudes of, um, and, you know, the effects of centuries of colonial imperialism overnight. Um, and we can't, um, dramatically change faulty thinking and um, uh, bad culture in a, you know, in a short time frame. Um, I think as well for it to be meaningful, it has really got to be internal changes. You know, it can't be just a tick box that, um, you know, as I said, you know, people have done this workshop or um, they've, 
met these um, metrics on a on a scale. Um, it really has to be, um, you know, what everyone talks about now is sort of taking people's hearts and minds along, um, and um, you know that that sort of meaningful cultural change is a generational thing. It's not, um, you know, it's not measured in terms of weeks or months or years. Um, and I think we're looking to um, starting now, but it's, um, you know, it, it is going to be a slow process and a process in evolution. And we've got to do everything we can um, within our abilities to do that. But I think to make it meaningful, um, those changes have to be internal. Thanks, Mary um, and Neil. Um, there is another question. Um, how do you get buy-in from consultants to improve culture when, um, when there's an awareness that these same cultures and um, these same consultants might be contributing to a negative um, culture, particularly for trainees in the unit? Um, I, I think that I think that alludes to um, what I was just saying, really, that, um, you know, you have to um, you have to start the dialogue, but you have to listen to the other person and where they're coming from, um, why they have those beliefs, um, why they're important to them, um, and then find that common ground where you can get them to. Um, see another point of view and see the value in the point of view and see the value in changing their their beliefs and their attitudes and really want to change their beliefs and attitudes. Um, it's easy to make people do things because you you know you reward good behavior with um, you know a tick for human resources or uh, more funding or whatever it might be and it's easy you know again to penalize bad behavior by by doing the opposite. Um, but, you know, it, it, it can't just be um, that superficially this is what's happening. It, it really has to come from within. Um, and that is something that, that takes time, takes patience, um, takes um, that strength coming from yourself and, um, you know, belief in yourself as well to be true to who you are and what you believe, um, but also, you know, patience and understanding um, uh, for for people that don't see things the same way as you, um, and uh, you know, finding um, a gentler way to help them change their beliefs as well. Thanks, Mary. Did you have anything to add, Neil, on that? Or? Yeah, I, I think that's the. I read that question, and I just, it, I agree. It's the, it's the, um, it's the bit we all struggle with. Um, just from a reflection for us, having going through a culture program now is, uh, I. So we have seen a change in language over two years in the um, unit. So we, it was called the Heart of Bow and the program. And so if and if you're ever walking around and being grumpy, like I'll, I'll have, a, you know, one of the senior nurses will come to me and say, it's not very hard to bow, Neil. And so we had this safe language we use where, that, where you know that you sort of take your thing, okay, I'm sort of I'm having a bad effect. That's lighthearted. Um, the truth is that it, the, the real issue is how, what do we do about the um, people who are not self-aware and not reflective? And I, th I think this has to be, uh, will end up being quite, specific um, things like in a crisis or in a ward round when we say what does the what does a, a safe ward round or a high quality ward round look like not just that information but about how we treat each other and how everyone feels respected and empowered and listen and we within that then define behaviors and we've talked about this with um, the group we're working with is that you could have the same way we have with hand hygiene if we define what those are and we're being observed. Um, it may well be that we have times. And we've done this in our um, consultant when we had some leadership training together, where we're stopped by the observer who says, "Okay, you guys are talking about this 
technical issue or you're on a ward round, but we've just noticed that um, there's been this sort of passive neglect of one person or there's something happening. Can we just talk about that? Because that doesn't fit within our agreed structures of an ideal ward round. Um, and then I, I think most of us will respond well to that. Obviously it's difficult and we have to build trust and make it safe. I suspect what happens, there'll be a small proportion of us who don't respond to that. Um, and then I'll, clearly the issue is, is it safe for you to work in this environment anymore? Um, but I think most of us will. Thanks, Neil. Um, there was another question that, um, that can be for both of you. Um, somebody's asked, do you believe a move to quotas in leadership from both a gender and um, a diversity perspective might help in the lack of representation? Mary? <laughs> um, yeah, yes and no, if, I, if I'm allowed to, to sit on the fence. Um, I, I think um, it um, highlights the issue. Um, it gives um, people with um, underrepresentation um, a voice. Um, and certainly that's one thing we want to look for um, uh, with, with the college. Um, and I want to acknowledge all the wonderful work that has been done um, by, by WIN um, in raising these issues. And also um, the um, Indigenous Affairs Committee um, and um, all the work there that Penny Stewart and the team have done. Um, and um, I think everyone um, is very accepting of having um, uh, gender equality for, um, for conference representation, for committee representation, um, for example. Um, but we're also looking to have more um, uh, representation from an Indigenous point of view, so Indigenous content at conferences, um, in workshops, in the exam, um, and, and I think that's that's all um, really is really helpful. Um, and I guess you know that's um, that is the sort of um, action following the, the mirrors, windows, sliding glass doors, metaphors that enables people to then see the potential for them to be in these roles, the potential for them to, to work in this field, the potential for them to be leaders. Um, and that in itself will ultimately uh, make the difference. Neil, I don't know if you um, got other thoughts. No, I think that's a wonderful answer. Um, there is another question. Um, it's for yourself, Neil, but I think for Mary, if you um, you might want to answer it first because it pertains, um, um, it relates to your talk, I think. Um, as this is from a trainee, I've observed many units in which a particular style of good trainee is accepted. Um, to confidence and assertiveness, it seems that this is sometimes indicative of the unconscious bias of the unit's leaders. This can be very dispiriting. How can we seek support and encouragement as a trainee in units such as this? Um, without such support, good trainees can often become lost. Um, that, that's, that's a really good question and yeah. something that um, I, I'm quite concerned about. And, and I see even in my unit that um, um, where I feel, you know, we, we are supportive for trainees but I still see there is that element of um, confusing um, assertion with confidence through to competence. Um, and um, again, that's sort of, you know, similar to me, if you have a supervisor of training who is, you know, an outward extrovert kind of person, that's what they look for um, in, in their own trainees. Um, I think um, I, I, I worry too that it's, you know, it may be very difficult for trainees who feel um, isolated in, in that environment. Um, I would encourage um, 
people who are in that situation to um, seek support from um, local trainee committee, um, from the national, binational um, trainee committees, um, and certainly um, channel feedback through that um, when um, there is any hospital accreditation. Um, we really rely on um, uh, information from trainees um, about the culture of the unit. The trainee survey as well is, is really important. Um, I think often it's hard for people to speak up because they're worried about how that appears and that has a negative impact on their assessment processes and things like that. Um, I think if you are sort of stuck in that situation and are feeling a bit disempowered and helpless, um, the, you know, take, take heart that, um, you know, that there are, um, uh, there is the potential when you move to other rotations or other jobs where there is more enlightenment. Um, but I think, it, it's, I think it's very hard if you're um, in that situation. Um, I think having a, a mentor that you can relate to, um, hopefully that unit has a, um, a welfare advocate as well um, that, that can help you through that. Um, but I think your, your um, support structures, if there's nothing within the unit, would be through the, um, the regional um, training committee um, and channeling through um, to the college. And we will provide what support we can for you in that situation. Um, Bruce Lister is doing a fabulous job with um, education of supervisors of training. Um, and hopefully this is a forum where we are working on, on changing attitudes, um, opening minds um, and bringing um, people from all backgrounds into those leadership roles. Thanks, Mary. Did you have anything to add, Neil? I, uh, look, I just support all that. I agree. I think that question, that issue of... Um, of units at a local level judging trainees based on their sort of you know biases towards likability and what they think is good is is outdated and we've got a, a way to move beyond that I think everything Mary says is right I mean I, you know you could almost make a case for saying of being very explicit about what a diverse group of intensivists we have in this country who are all wonderful intensivists so people that mirrors sort of doors you know they can see that there's an example it doesn't help the local effect of feeling that you're not valued and um i think that's and i don't have the answer to how do we stop people feeling that they're not valued in their unit um i, I think that's a, a big problem it takes a lot of consideration by us over a long time to fix it um, unfortunately, because of time, I probably will have to um, unfortunately wrap up the discussion. It's been um, such a privilege and honour to have both um, yourself, Mary and Neil, um, talk to all of us. And um, it just speaks to the fact that we still have quite a number of questions that have come through in the group chat, that there's clearly lots of people for whom this, um, this talk was really important. Um, and still some issues that have been raised in the Q&A, um, particularly with um, you know, the need for diversity and representation of other groups, such as Indigenous Australians in the college, which um, I think it's a concern for um, for many of us. Um, also interesting to see that, you know, there's a lot of answer, unanswered questions that going forward, um, we can all um, hopefully um, address together in the future. Um, but thank you so much to, um, to yourself, Mary and to Neil, um, and as well as to Anzix for helping us host this event. Um, I'd also like to um, say thank you to Lucy and Sandra, um, as well as Suzanne and, um, and Ruby, who've also um, been integral to organizing this first webinar. Um, we hope to have um, many more in the future. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Vanessa. Yeah. Thanks, Vanessa. That was fantastic. Thanks, Mary. I really enjoyed your talk. Oh, thanks, Lucy. Daniel, it was tremendous. Good to see you both online. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I love that. I wrote all these things down. I have to, I have to read up about all these people now. <laughs> yeah, they were challenging questions, which is good. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, they're loud, but they're the right ones, aren't I mean, you know, they're good questions and uh, hopefully in five years' time we'll have solved them all. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, I think... Um, I mean, if, if, you, um, if you think back, um, you know, these weren't even, like 20 years ago, these wouldn't have even been, questions wouldn't have even been asked. So yeah, I, I think in another, take another 20 years, I'm sure, but um, I think we'll be further forward. And it's just, you know, it's a work in progress. Yeah, yeah, but a worthwhile one, yeah. Cool. Right. Thank you both. All right. Thank you. And thank you very much for inviting me and yes. uh, all of it. That's incredible. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks to everyone. See you tomorrow, Mary. You will. Five and a half. Bye. Right. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye.